today in rabbis, faggot spies, naughty communist, public toilets, London high class cruising, queer politics and more. With Huleni. Okay, so we are here with Hugh Lemmy to talk about gay spies. Um, Hugh is a novelist who has written on culture, politics, and sexuality for all of your favorite online publications, and is the author of three books, Chubbs, The Demonization of My Working Arse, Red Tory, My Corbin Chemsex Hell, and Unknown Language. He's also the co-host of the podcast Bad Gays, and you can find him on Twitter at Hugh Lemmy or on hugh.substack.com. So today, Hugh is going to speak to us about espionage, British intelligence agencies and state security, um, homosexuality and class in mid 20th century Britain. And then the three of us will have a short discussion on it. Um, okay, uh, over to you, Hugh. Do you wanna say something short about what the talk's gonna be on before we uh, go over to the talk? Yeah, sure, yeah. I've made a, um, a short, uh, uh, film almost like a talk with some visuals just because it's a bit more interesting and um, the idea is to address the uh, relationship between homosexuality and espionage in, in English society and culture both um, both literally and also culturally the wider cultural effects uh, in the sort of 20 years before and after the second world war looking at the second world war as a sort of fulcrum on which um, the relationship between uh, the state and gays changed in terms of uh, the relationship with intelligence services, but it's pretty self-explanatory. So, okay, and then sort of. When I began to go in search of men, it was already familiar to me: the covert speculative glance, the underhand sign, the blank exchange of passwords, the hot, hurried unburdening. All, all familiar. Even the territory was the same, the public lavatories, the grim suburban pubs, the garbage-strewn back alleyways, and, in summer, the city's dreamy, tenderly green, innocent parks, whose clement air I sullied with my secret whisperings. These are the words of Victor Maskell, the main character in John Banville's 1997 novel, The Untouchable. The novel is a, a Roman a clef, an intentionally thinly veiled re retelling of the life of a famed British art historian, Sir Anthony Blunt, a man probably best described by using the words of one of history's most potent and vital homophobes, the ninth Marcus of Queensbury, as a snob queer. Yes, Blunt really was a snob queer, the son of a Church of England vicar. He had spent much of his childhood in Paris, where his father was seconded to the chapel of the British Embassy. There he learnt the language and began a lifelong love affair with fine art. He studied modern languages at Trinity College, Cambridge, and went on to become a fellow at Trinity, completing his graduate research in French art history. He was an expert in the work of the French Baroque painter Nicolas Poussin, and his commitment to this refined world of academic art and research led him to become no less than the director of the Courtauld Institute of Art and surveyor of the Queen's pictures. He was also, it goes without saying, a homosexual. And being born in 1907, for most of his life, this was both illegal and, to a greater or lesser extent, taboo in the UK. This is a public lavatory in St James's Park, a former swampland off Whitehall that was first drained and laid out as parkland by James I in 1603. Its specific location in the centre of London put it at the nexus of power in the early 20th century. To its east is Whitehall, the home of the British Civil Service and the nerve centre of the Empire. To its west is Buckingham Palace, the home of the Royal Family. It is bordered on the north by the cultural centre of London's theatre district, the Haymarket, the private members' clubs of St James's, and the hub of London's seedier nightlife, Soho. To the south are Wellington Barracks, home to the Guards, a barrack house of young, often working-class men. 
In the daytime, nursemaids and governesses would take their young charges to feed the pelicans who inhabit the park, and couples might stroll on their lunch break under the weak, wintry sun. At night, the park, like the nearby Hyde Park, became a lagoon of darkness amongst the brightly lit, tightly packed streets that surround them. A darkness which, amongst the bushes and public toilets, became a place where homosexuality could not just exist, but prosper. At night, the parks of London could become queer spaces. Homosexuality in London before the war was in part marked by a sexual subjectivity that, like everything in England, was demarcated by class. Following the de rigueur understanding of homosexuals at the time, elucidated by the earliest sexologists, there was a belief that homosexuals were either inverts or perverts. Inverts were broken men, congenital queers who suffered homosexuality as an affliction, possibly a sickness. They were to be pitied at best. Perverts were men of low morals, often coded as working class, who could be swayed into disgusting behaviour either through circumstance or financial reward, because they lacked the moral wherewithal to resist. The inverts were either middle or upper class, or at least aspired to be, and were coded as such. The two groups pointedly did not socialise together, and much homosex in London, central London at the time instead operated through sex work. In Being Gay in the 30s, an episode of the early British queer TV series Gay Life from 1981, two old friends meet in the top room of the same gay pub they visited 50 years earlier as young men. They sit in JB's, the upstairs lounge of the old King's Head, a now closed gay bar on Bear Street just off left Leicester Square. Quote, the men who drank in the upstairs bar at JB's called themselves sisters. End quote. The narrator explains... The two men, the fabulously named Gifford Skinner and his friend, casually reminisce on their social lives at the time, referring to themselves and their friends using female pronouns, with traditionally women's nicknames, like Rosie Bothways, who Gifford remembers was also known as Russian Rosie. Later, the men visit the Lily Pond, a camp name for the upstairs tea rooms at the Lion's Corner House in Piccadilly Circus, where sympathetic nippies or waitresses would seat them together. The Lily Pond was a famous or infamous gay hangout for almost four decades, and its reputation led to men who thought they might be what Gifford called musical or so, visiting the tea room and being inducted into the cult. Much is made in the documentary of the use of feminine pronouns and camp names being indicative that homosexuals at the time regarded themselves as a third sex, as indicated by the fact that they'd go to cruising grounds and pay real men, read heterosexual and or working class men, to fuck them. Another man in the episode is quite clear that for the sisters to fuck each other would have been verging on taboo. No, it had to be real men, whose role as the active partner and whose class status, feeding into the idea of perversion, allowed them to enjoy financially and presumably sexually satisfying encounters without themselves being inscribed as queer. These men were frequently working men, rough trade, or the guardsmen of the barracks who could be bought in the park. In Queer London, the historian Matt Holbrook describes the experience of a guardsman called Cecil, who was, in the 1920s, initiated into this sexual subculture within the barrack room. Quote, Shortly after enlisting, another guardsman took him to London and introduced him to some people he called soldiers' friends. Cecil learned of the possibilities of homosex, blackmail and theft, the sexual, social and commercial pleasures, and masculine status that it offered. Introduced to the sites where those opportunities could be found, he began to frequent Hyde Park regularly, often with other guardsmen looking for queers. He received guidance in the conventions that should structure his interactions with other men, what he should and should not do, where and how he should do it, end quote. These are the conventions to which Banville refers when he talks at one remove about Blunt. These were the conventions of the park that minimised risk, conventions that could perhaps be understood and read by the more worldly heterosexuals who might know of it. When Ian Harvey was arrested in St James's Park in 1958, these were the conventions he fell foul of because the risk was always inherent. Ian Harvey was privately educated, a graduate of Oxford University and a Conservative MP for Harrow East. He was caught in the bushes of St James's Park with his trousers down by a park warden one freezing November night, engaging in an act of gross indecency with a 19-year-old guardsman 
Anthony Plant of the Coldstream Guards. It cost him his job as Parliamentary Undersecretary of State at the Foreign Office and his seat in Parliament. When told, Winston Churchill remarked, On the coldest night of the year, it makes you proud to be British. His arrest can only be a matter of metres meters from the so-called Tin and Stone Bridge, which crosses the Park Lake. In the middle of the 20th century, the bridge became a landmark where spies and handlers would meet to exchange documents, and the site where rookie members of the Secret Service were met by their handlers and first welcomed into the world of espionage. That these two places, the Inverts Cruising Ground and the Spies Meeting Point, exist in the same space is no coincidence. As well as being the heart of power, it's also because the two communities share an inextricable link in British history. A world of secrets, lies, deceptions and extortions, the history of British espionage is interlaced with queer lives. Let's move on from the park. If we cross Birdcage Walk, we find ourselves in the Warren-like streets that lie behind the Houses of Parliament and Victoria Station. Tucked between the numerous ministries and a former site of the police headquarters, New Scotland Yard, sits a luxury hotel on Caxton Street called St Ermines. It was built as a horseshoe of mansion blocks in the late Victorian period, kitchenless apartments serviced by servants, but changing needs saw it converted into a hotel in the last years of the 19th century. In the 1930s, its luxurious stylings and convenient location, tucked away down a side street, but close to important government buildings, meant it was used as a meeting point for agents and handlers in the early 1930s. The hotel is only a few minutes away from 54 Broadway, the headquarters of the Secret Intelligence Service. You may know the organisation better as MI6, the wing of the intelligence arm of the British government, which deals with external and overseas threats. From 1924, they occupied the offices of 54 Broadway, and it was from this building that the Government Ho Code and Cipher School was run. Today, this organisation is known as GCHQ, and is the sector of the intelligence service that deals with protecting information, coding and encryption. Prior to the war, working for the Code and Cipher School in Broadway, was a young mathematician and cryptoanalysis, cryptoanalyst, Whose, uh, whose later work would be integral to breaking the complex cryptographic codes produced by the Nazi secret cryptographic encoder, the Enigma machine. His name was Alan Turing. Turing and his associates would probably have drunk in the Caxton Bar, the bar of the St. Ermin Hotel, along with other guests, like the iconic stalwart of British queer cultural life in the early 20th century, the playwright, songwriter and singer Noel Coward. I say that because when, in 1939, the uh, St. Ermin Hotel was officially commandeered by the security services on the outbreak of war, Coward was indisputably a guest. That's because throughout the war, Coward's contacts as a queer cultural icon, one whose performances were sought out across the world, became a useful tool in the secret services' attempts to bring the United States into the war. Perhaps this should come as little surprise. An early opponent of appeasement trends within the class to which he entertains, he was said, following uh, fellow Queen Ivan Novello's cheering of Chamberlain's peace summit at the Munich conference, to have punched Novello so hard he nearly knocked him out. Prior to the war, the men at St. Ermin's decided to send Coward to Europe, in cities such as Warsaw and Helsinki, to perform and, on the side, to begin feeling out and see setting up networks again, uh, amongst sympathetic figures in the cultural world and also couriering uh, secret documents. Ironically, it was exactly Coward's queer flamboyance that allowed him to perform an intelligence role without suspicion. Talking decades later, he would say, quote, Celebrity was wonderful cover. My disguise would be my own reputation as a bit of an idiot, a merry playboy. End quote. On the outbreak of war, he'd be trained at the GC and CS at Bletchley Park and St. Ermin's Hotel. And he was sent first to France, where he visited the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, Coward fans, although Coward was no fan of theirs, once writing of the former king that, quote, I've known for years that he had a common mind and liked second-rate people, and I am sure it is a good thing for England that he abdicated, end quote. He would later be sent to the United States to meet with FDR and help drum up support for US intervention in the war. 
It's clear that during the war, homosexuality was far from an impediment to recruitment in Britain's security services. Indeed, quite the opposite. The intelligence community at the time worked not so much through strict protocols of ensuring security of information, but through the pre-existing codes embedded within its class structure. So much is clear in the recruitment of the Cambridge Five, a group of five double agents who operated at the height of multiple sectors of the British state for almost two decades, after being recruited by the Soviet Interior Ministry, the NKVD, while at Cambridge University in the 1930s. The spying was initiated by a Soviet agent called Arnold Deutsch, who in 1934 had travelled to England specifically to recruit possible NKVD agents from Britain's elite universities. He'd been impressed by a young left-wing Cambridge graduate named Kim Philby, who in turn recruited more agents. Two of those he signed up for the NKVD were Guy Burgess and Anthony Blunt, who had both been members of a small and prestigious secret society at the university known as the Cambridge Apostles, and another Cambridge graduate, Donald Maclean. The men were drawn to work in the NKVD for ideological reasons, both their support for the USSR at a time when fascism in Europe was on the rise, and potentially because in the Soviet model they saw, at this time, a move towards a more liberated sexual landscape. In the words of historian Christopher Andrew, quote, Deutsch shared the same visionary faith as his, cap- as his Cambridge recruits in the future of a human race freed from the exploitation and alienation of the capitalist system. His message of liberation had all the greater appeal for the five because it had a sexual as well as political dimension. All were rebels against the strict sexual mores as well as the antiqu- antiquated class system of interwar Britain. Burgess and Blunt were gay and McLean bisexual at a time when homosexual relations, even between consenting adults, were illegal. End quote. Burgess and Blunt's sex lives were intertwined, although not as lovers, but because Burgess, a prolific and dedicated cruiser, served as a sort of pimp to the aloof and diffident Blunt. But this homosexual brotherhood mirrored and extended the bonds of implicit social trust drawn between men of the same class background at the time. All of the men rose to prominent positions within the British state. Maclean worked in the diplomatic service and the foreign office. Burgess worked first for the BBC and then Section D, the propaganda arm of MI6. Philby worked for Special Operations Executive at Broadway and St. Ermins, and then for MI6, the Secret Intelligence Service. Blunt worked first in the army, and then as assistant to Guy Liddell, Deputy Director General of MI5, where he liaised between MI5 and the Allied Supreme Command Headquarters. Both he and Philby had access to highly sensitive information decrypted from the Enigma machine, which they passed to the Soviets, giving them prior warning of Operation Barbarossa, the Nazi invasion of the USSR, for example. Not one of the Cambridge Five spying was vetted before given their, given their, being given their roles in the British intelligence services and foreign office. It was their social roles and class background, the type of men they were, that was seen as a better defence against security threats than background checks. And their homosexuality, which was widely known, was no impediment to their accession through the ranks. This seems to have been standard throughout the 1930s and 40s. Class status was a clearer and more legible subjectivity than a homosexual identity, even if, as in the case of the Cambridge Apostles, homosexuality was an intrinsic part of the intersocial bond between certain groups of upper-class men. If we leave St. Ermin's Hotel, whose hotel rooms were training grounds for hand-to-hand combat and other guerrilla fighting techniques through the SOE, we can pass through the quiet back streets of Westminster, home to dry cleaners and lobbying firms, government offices and the flats of expensive male escorts offering all manners of pleasure and pains. We travel down Horse Ferry Road to end up at Millbank, home of the Conservative Party headquarters, ITV television studios, and the site of the world's first modern penitentiary. Facing the river is a large, austere building, built in 1930. On either side of the door are statues of England's patron saint, St George, and the allegorical figure of Britannia, she who rules the waves. In the 1930s, it was the home of MI5, Britain's internal security services, 
and has been home to MI5 again since the 1990s. Perhaps here is a good point to talk about how it all changed, how homosexuality went from being an asset for the security services, with its shared codes of subterfuge and subtle codes, or reading social clues and Banville's hot, hurried unburdenings, to something else, a cause of alarm, of panic even, a wider social fear of homosexualities as tra- homosexuals as traitors in our midst. The aftermath of the Second World War saw, as the return to peace often does, an immense social change in the UK. Not only did the 1945 election see a new Labour government who implemented massive restructurings of the British state and a new welfare system, but the personal and psychological effects of the war changed many people's attitudes to the class system and towards homosexuality. As with troops returning in the US, many had been, to, uh, many had been exposed to homosexuality, situational or otherwise, as well as to homosexual subcultures for the first time. In the post-war years, the conception of the homosexual changed within the British imagination. As we have seen, there was a thriving homosexual subculture within the metropolis in the interwar years, but more widely, homosexuality was seen to be, in the words of Chris Waters, socially invisible. There was virtually no sociological study on homosexuality in the interwar period, and press coverage, where it existed, tended to either revert to euthanism or frame the homosexual purely purely in terms of sexual deviance and criminality. In the aftermath of the war, the concern about homosexuality as a social problem gained renewed prominence, alongside other issues such as youth delinquency and rising divorce rates, seen to be an effect of the social changes stimulated by the war. As one doctor noted in 1947, quote, The problem presented by recent changes in moral standards exceeds in its possible effects on the well-being of the nation that of any other problem awaiting solution. End quote. The same year, the first conference on homosexuality was held in London, and throughout the late 1940s and early 50s, while homosexuality was still seen as a problem, it was understood as a social problem as much as a criminal or medical problem. That social problem, one informed by social factors as it were, was becoming more prominent and hence was exacerbated in the public imagination. In the United Kingdom, homosexuality started to shed its social invisibility through a series of scandals around national security. Being of such national importance, the euphemism of pre-war reporting was dropped, yet the homosexual element of many of the stories, while criminal, were, was often secondary to larger geopolitical concerns. As such, homosexuality started to become a topic of adult discussion, and with it, discussion around law reform entered the public consciousness, just as homosexuality itself was becoming more widely understood and reviled. As such, the period of one, was one of intense repression. Gay men who previously could have navigated social life under under the radar of more social ignorance increasingly found their behaviour was more legible to heterosexual society, and hence they were socially pleased not just sex, but not just for their sex, but for uh, but as a, a homosexual identity. While at the same time, state repression against homosex per se and sex cultures such as cottaging and cruising were becoming increasingly strict. Vice was on the public agenda. Both Burgess and McLean had been attracting unwelcome attention in their work due to their cruising habits, as well as their drinking. And in 1951, Burgess was fired from his foreign office job in Washington. The same year, the US anti-Soviet counterintelligence program, Venona, which was started in 1943, was beginning to bear fruit. Kim Philby, also in Washington and with access to its results, realised that McLean was likely to be revealed as a Soviet asset. And in the summer of 1951, Burgess and McLean, tipped off by their Soviet handlers, left the UK and defected to the Soviet Union. According to Matthew Bellamy, the exposure of the spying was, quote, perceived by the public as, as a symbolic betrayal of the principal assumption of the British Secret Service that the gentleman, meaning meaning the ruling class Oxford-educated male, was above reproach and could therefore be trusted with national safety and security in the most dangerous of contexts, end quote. That betrayal in the popular mind was linked to the men's homosexual behaviour. 
The shock seemed to undermine the assumptions of class that underpinned British society at the time, well before the 1960s wave of satire and anti-establishment feeling became commonplace. Faced with a challenge to the class system, Bellamy continues, quote, Quickly, though, public discourse seized upon a key aspect of the Burgess and McLean case that served to differentiate them from previous cases of espionage, homosexuality. In 1955, the Daily Mail editorialised that, quote, Since it must be notorious in the Foreign Service that the two men were corrupt and homosexual, it is legitimate to ask if they were protected by powerful defenders. End quote. Both this conspiratorializing and concurrent, more sympathetic discourses within the medical and sociological professions were working to establish that homosexuality was not simply a perversion, but a socially constituted identity, and that homosexual, homosexuals perhaps recognize each other as part of a community. But if homosexuals were a thing, a type of person, and they knew and recognized each other, yet were largely socially invisible to heterosexuals, then what you start to have is not necessarily a a social minority as much as a, a fifth column, a conspiratorial threat. That was certainly the implication in the United States, where the Republican Senator Joe McCarthy preceded his famous Red Scare, a witch hunt for communists working within the federal government, with a so called Lavender Scare, hunting for homosexuals in the federal government. For McCarthy, homosexuality and communism were intrinsically linked. As he told reporters, If you want to be up against McCarthy, boys, you've got to be either a communist or a cocksucker. This was not merely a homophobic smear against communists, but a strategic belief. In 1953, McCarthy began purging homosexuals from the State Department, dismissing 425 known or suspected homosexuals, Meanwhile, as part of the same lavender scare, President President Dwight D. Eisenhower uh, signed Executive Order uh, 10450, barring homosexuals from working for federal government. 5,000 gays were purged. Republican National Chairman Guy George Gabrielson claimed that, quote, sexual perverts who have infiltrated our government in recent years were perhaps as dangerous as the actual communists. End quote. In the US, ironically, this was perhaps a key instigator for pushing new recruits into a very small nascent gay rights or homophile movement. Indeed, the astronomer Frank Kameny, who was working for the US Army's uh, Army Map Service, was amongst those fired for suspected homosexuality. He would go on to form the Matakine Society of Washington, a group independent from the larger Matakine Society, and become a prominent gay rights activist. The Lavender Scare also led to a wider suppression of leftist currents within the early homophile movement, uh, as they were fearful that the presence of communists would lead to greater government attention and suppression. McCarthy's Lavender Scare had implications in the UK, not least after the defection of Burgess and Maclean. In 1952, a peer named Baron Montague uh, invited his friend, the journalist Peter Wildblood, to his estate, Bowley. Bowley had been, as luck would have it, a special operations executive training camp during the war, but now it was the site of one of the major homosexual scandals of the post-war period. Wild's blood invited his lover, a young RAF airman, and his lover's friend, also in the RAF, uh, as well as Montague's cousin, Michael Pitt Rivers. The five men spent a weekend uh, dancing, making out and having sex. The police, however, as part of the UK witch hunt against queers, blackmailed the two young airmen into giving evidence against Montague, Pitt Rivers and Wildblood. And uh, Montague was imprisoned for 12 months for sexual offences and Pitt Rivers and Wildblood got 18 months. As Montague later wrote, quote, In the Cold War atmosphere in the 1950s, when witch hunts, later called the Lavender Scare, were ruining the lives of many gay men and lesbian women in the United States, the parallel political atmosphere in Britain was virulently anti-homosexual. The then Home Secretary, Sir David Maxwell Fife, had promised a new drive against male vice that would rid England of this plague. As many as a thousand men were locked up in Britain's Britain's prisons every year, amid a widespread police clampdown on homosexual offences. Undercover officers acting as agents provocateurs 
word pose as gay men soliciting in public places, the prevailing mood was one of barely concealed paranoia. End quote. The campaign against homosexuals was put into place by Sir John Knott Bower, the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police. In 1953, in the Sydney Morning Telegraph, journalist Douglas, uh, Donald, Donald Horn wrote, quote, The plan originated under strong United States advice to Britain to weed out homosexuals as hopeless security risks from important government jobs. One of the Yard's top rankers, Commander E.A. Cole, recently spent three months in America consulting with FBI officials in putting finishing touches to the plan. But the plan was extended as a war on all vice when Sir John Knott Bower uh, took over as the new commissioner at Scotland Yard in August. Sir John swore that he would rip the cover off all of London's filth spots. Under laxer police methods before the US-inspired plan began, and before Sir John moved into the top job at the Yard as man with a mission, Montague and his film director friend Kenneth Hume might never have been charged with grave offences against Boy Scouts. Sir John swung into action on a nationwide scale. He enlisted the support of local police throughout England to step up the number of arrests for homosexual offences. For many years past, the police had turned a blind eye to male vice. They made arrests only when definite complaints were made from innocent people, or when homosexuality had encouraged other crimes. They knew the names of thousands of perverts, many of high social position and some world famous, but they took no action. Now, meeting Sir John's demands, they are making it a priority to increase the number of arrests. The special branch began compiling a black book of known perverts and influential government jobs after the disappearance of the diplomats Donald MacLean and Guy Burgess, who were known to have pervert associates. Now comes the difficult task of sidetracking these men into less important jobs, or putting them behind bars. End quote. The 1952 government report into the defections focused upon the role of homosexuality in intelligence services and made recommendations, stating, quote, Homosexuals are unstable psychologically and liable to mental stresses and strains. By reason of this instability, and also because they are liable to blackmail and other forms of pressure, they are potential security risks. Their conduct is liable at the least to create prejudice, and at the worst to cause grave scandal and bring discredit on the service. If this is accepted, it follows that it is desirable to ensure, if we can, that homosexuals do not enter the service, and to arrange, if we can, that such homosexuals as may already be in it are eliminated from it. End quote. Those arrangements prohibiting openly homosexual men from working in the Foreign Office and the intelligence agencies lasted until 1991. Just down the river is a notorious address that holds many dark sexual secrets. Dolphin Square We could focus here upon the fictitious. Flat 110B, Hood House, is the home of Agent Peter Gwillem in John le Carre's spy, spy thriller masterwork, The Spy Who Came In From The Cold. Gwillem is a recurrent character in le Carre's Smiley novels, and was played as a gay man by Benedict Cumberbatch in the 2011 film version of Tinker Taylor's Soldier Spy. As Cumberbatch, Cumberbatch said at the time, sexuality was a very powerful tool then, I keep my character's homosexuality secret because you are so open to blackmail. It necessitates a certain amount of secretiveness, which goes hand in hand with spying. Le Carre, however, plays homosexuality slightly different in his early books. While Gwillem is never coded as queer, Ash, a Soviet spy who picks up uh, Alec Lemas in The Spy Who Came In From The Cold, is... For Le Carre, homosexuality makes, marks out an agent not necessarily as deceptive, a virtue in the Le Carre universe, but as weak-willed, almost a dilettante in the world, world of the dark arts, whose emotions and desires override his ability to practice spycraft. Hood House also has a long history of MI5. Number 308 was used for almost two decades as a location for the department that arranged the infiltration of agents into domestic subversive organisations. It was also the home of Maxwell Knight, the MI5 spymaster, who was the model for the character M in James Bond. 
Knight was an anti-Semite, an ardent fascist and virulently homophobic, but also, according to the notorious MP and champion cocksucker Tom Dryberg, whom he regarded as a Soviet agent, a queer himself. But we want to focus on number 807, Hood House. This apartment was rented by John Vassell, a clerical officer to the British naval attaché in Moscow. Arriving in Moscow in 1952, Vassell's class position within the diplomatic service excluded him. Unlike many of the upper-class elite who made up the diplomatic corps, Vassell was firmly middle-class, the son of a hospital chaplain and a nurse. Lonely and isolated on this on this basis, he made friends with a Polish man who worked at the British Embassy. His friend introduced him to the gay underworld in Moscow, where homosexuality was also still a crime. One evening, he attended a gay party where he was plied heavily with booze. He got drunk and lost his senses and ended up fucking a number of men. Unknown to him, the party was a honey trap and a number of photos were taken of him in compromising positions. The KGB, the successor organisation to the NKVD, blackmailed Vassal into becoming a spy, paying him for good measure. For four years, he spied for the Soviets in Moscow, before returning to London, where he worked for the Admiralty, passing vital military secrets to the KGB, and becoming a valuable intelligence asset. It was his expensive luxury flat in Hood House that was his undoing. Despite only earning, only earning a salary of £750 a year, his outgoings were over 3000 he also indulged a love of snappy dressing, owning over 30 suits from Savile Row. The British are eternally eagle-eyed to class signifiers, and Vassal was stepping outside the expectations of a middle-class civil servant. Suspecting he had another form of income, his colleagues reported him. In September 1962, he was arrested and charged with spying. He made a full confession and was jailed for 18 years. The case seemed to prove right the post-war assumptions about homosexuals in the intelligence services. Not only were there predilections for, inter- uh, for illegal sex and invitation to the KGB to blackmail them, but the nature of the homosexual as a subject too. No longer were homosexual sex acts seen as merely criminal acts, but they were indicative of a form of identity that was itself incompatible with discretion, secrecy or loyalty. As the Hungarian writer uh, Georg Mikas said of Vassal, it was his, quote, vanity, his childish snobbery, his devouring ambition and complete lack of humour that pushed him so deep into the quagmire, end quote. And it's not a leap of the imag- imagination to read such a verdict as queer coded. So we see over the course of almost 50 years, with the Second World War as its fulcrum, uh, that the relationship between the homosexual uh, between the homosexual and the spy in British society really turned on its axis. As the figure of the homosexual became clearer in the public imagination as a recognisable type, with particular characteristics and social habits, his role as an agent of the British state flipped. All the social and class forms of solidarity that were assets that led to the recruitment of homosexuals became liabilities, as the homosexual part of the subject came to the fore as the defining characteristic of the man. As anti-communism became a driving force, the homosexual became a risk as either a potential leftist contaminant, as in the case of the Cambridge Five, or as a potential blackmail risk. Yet, as with the purge of homosexuals in the United States, it was the aggressive attempts to suppress the homosexual within society and the intelligence services that actually encouraged the development of the homosexual as a recognisable political subject. Just as Frank Kameny's dismissal from federal, em- unemploy- federal employment and his blacklisting led to him taking up the mantle of homophile activism in the US, so in the UK, Peter Wildblood's public humiliation and outing as a homosexual man led to his taking up the battle for homosexual law reform. After serving 18 months in prison, he published Against the Law, a powerful book concerning his case and his experiences within prison. In it, he openly and unapologetically identified as a homosexual man and laid out a case for reform of sex crimes law as well as for prison reform. The book became a foundation stone for the argument for reform in the UK 
And in 1957, the government opened a committee to examine the reform of sexual offences legislation in the country. The report published by the committee was known after the chairman of the committee as the Wolfenden Report. Only three men were found to give evidence to the committee, all of them middle or upper class, but only Wildblood allowed himself to be openly identified as a homosexual man. His prosecution and uh, and the publication of his book meant he had nothing left to hide. Based on his testimony, the report found that, quote, homosexuality cannot legitimately be regarded as a disease, end quote, unlike earlier sexological models, and it recommended that homosexual sex be partially decriminalized between consenting men in private. The report was the basis for the uh, 1967 Sexual Offences Act, which implemented its recommendations. As such, the history of the changing understanding of the homosexual in 20th century Britain is intrinsically tied up with matters of state security. Both, both, both purposefully and unintentionally, the state's relationship with homosexual men working for its intelligence agencies has shaped popular understandings of homosexuality. What we understand as a homosexual man in the UK is perhaps uniquely inflected by the skills and values of spycraft and by its discontents. It's a very queer business, espionage. Let's let's get right into it. So, I mean, I have to say, Hugh, <laughs> I've always thought there was something quite gay about gay, uh, something quite gay about like spy movies and spy TV shows with all the sort of like secret signs and subtle glances and the code words and the covert gatherings and whatever. I don't really watch much anymore, but um, when I was a kid, I really loved all the like CIA shows um, that we were sort of inundated with in in the US. Um, Anyway, so loved your talk, thanks for it. Um, I wanna pick up on something about the the lavender scare. So in the talk, you mentioned that the lavender scare dovetailed with the red scare of the 1950s. Um, And the red scare obviously wasn't really it was, it was just as much about targeting sort of imagined perceived communists as it was about target, targeting actual communists um, in the federal government. Um, and so I was wondering if, if there's something similar going on with the lavender scare. So to, to what extent is it actually about homosexuals or is, um, is, the, is the persecution of homosexuals used as a um, pretext for going after other people? So like, did, did other people fall victim to the lavender scare in the in the same way that that um, happened with the red scare. Uh, well, I'm not not as knowledgeable about the American uh, uh, era and what was happening in America in the same era. But as far as I'm aware, um, it was a, a genuine purge, as it were. Like the people who were fired were homosexuals, and it wasn't it wasn't something that was like necessarily whipped up to um, to kick out dissidents of other types. I think we can kind of take McCarthy at his word when he believes at that point that um, uh, that there is a relationship between uh, homosexuals within the within the um, American uh, state, the State Department, and them being leftists. Um, and then there's a wider question as well of this sort of model that he's discussing, which is he's he, the, the, it's almost like a trial run for the Red Red Scare, and that he's um, looking at homosexuality as a contagion, like a social contagion that has to be purged, um, otherwise it'll spread, uh, and that it's um, that it's a subversive uh, idea or it's a sub- subversive subject. <clears throat> so, but the difference between the Red Scare and the Lavender Scare is that the State Department was full of homosexuals. Um, naturally almost you know like it's not a surprise that the sort of educated single people in that in that era with lots of time would rise up throughout the state department so so yeah like the, the five thousand uh who were purged um and i think that's the way to look at it is to look at it as as a sort of um uh a political purge they were undoubtedly um many they, they were homosexuals and they were Purged on the basis of that specifically, yeah. Um, but there's like wider questions to ask that that spring up from talking about the relationship between lavender scare and red scare. Um, I think it's right to see that probably McCarthy saw it as being success, like as a, a successful trial run of the red scare, 
in that you you can produce a, an enemy easily. And secondly, that if you taint communists with homosexuality um, in a homophobic society, then you have this like extra weight against it when you start to move against communists or leftists in general. And then lastly is looking at the relationship, I guess, between what was emerging at the time in homophile movements and um, their relationship with the left. Um, ben Miller, who is my co-host on Bad Gaze, writes really well about this, but he, he sort of, when he's talking about Harry Hay as um, one of the pioneers of the, of the homophile movement, he says it's really important to look at where Hay was getting his ideas from and his ideas for how to build a gay movement was around building hom the homosexual as a cultural subject, um, as a political cultural subject. Um, and so he took as the model, uh, the sort of Stalinist ideas for um, national minorities within the Soviet Union, which is that if you build a recognizable community based around shared uh, beliefs, uh, like a shared language, like a, a community who recognizes and identifies itself with, with itself, then you can achieve what he wants to achieve, which is something equivalent to minority rights. So you have to think about in the pre-war period, you don't necessarily, especially in America and the UK, have this idea of a homosexual culture, of like a gay culture, of gay, a gay community that necessarily can be, um, that can recognize itself and therefore can achieve rights. So the only reason you can argue for gay rights is if you argue it as an identity so, and become an identity, you have to build it as an identity. Um, and so as a result, I mean, the, the, the early homophile movements were chock full of leftists, you know, like they were, they were leftists, pre-existing members, like people who had a lot of experience as community organizers or as political organizers within the Communist Party USA or various Trotskyist organizations um, then come together and, and the effect of the lavender scare upon the homophile movements and, and this sort of anxiety, this purge, is really to kick out a lot of the left out of the whole farm movement. So, so what starts off as quite radical in its way, um, very quickly becomes something that's very much more, once, once it's established itself and the idea of a community, it very quickly purges the left itself. Um, people like Harry Hay are purged from the homo farm movement in order to avoid further state repression because the homo, in the same way that the communists don't want to be tainted with the homosexuals, the homosexuals don't want to be tainted with the communists. Um, oh, I didn't know that Harry Hay was expelled from the homophobe movement. I, he was expelled also from the Communist Party, right? From CPUSA. Oh, okay. Um, well, actually, my second question was going to be about um, the the movement. So this is sort of perfect. Um, I I liked the that sort of irony that came through in the talk, uh, which is that homophobe uh, homophile organizing efforts um, are both aided and constrained at the same time by this by the escalation of, of the lavender scare in the early 1950s. Um, I think I do think it's important to remember that um, the early gay and lesbian activists of the 50s, of the sort of 60s and onwards, um, they were that was not a movement against some sort of trans historical repression or some timeless sentiment of phobia of homophobia, but rather a direct response to um, the expansion of punitive um, and sort of repressive state apparatuses and structural adjustments after the Second World War. So they are responding to that particular context. Um, and I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm more familiar with the US context, um, but I assume it's sort of similar in Britain that you have the social disruption, disruption of the Second World War that's then followed by a, a very uneven and contradictory era of prosperity where on, on the one hand, you get the reconsolidation of traditional sexual and gender regimes, um, primarily through the restoration of the private nuclear family, um, but also through suburbanization in the States, um, this sort of extreme pronatalist movement. Um, but then on the other hand, women are impelled to re-enter the labor force after demobilization um, because their supplemental income is needed to meet the new sort of consumer expectations um, and, sort of post-war standard of living. Um, and you also get emergent urban underground cultures of sort of new social and sexual identities um, and also moral panics about sexual deviancy, deviancy like the lavender scare. Um, 
so it's it's ironic I say ironic because it's sort of like the state's representation of homosexuality as this pervasive insidious threat that will spread and destabilize the entire socio-political order uh, lends legitimacy to the activists invocation of homosexuality as having these revolutionary capacities um there's a, there's a passage in John D'Amelio's essay capitalism and gay identity um, that I was re reminded of where he he says um, as the gay and lesbian subculture expanded and grew more visible in the post-World War II era, oppression by the state intensified, becoming more systematic and inclusive. Gay liberation was a response to this contradiction. Um, so I guess my question is just if there's if if there's a similar uh, sort of dialectical movement happening in the U.S. So did did state repression? Uh, sorry, in Britain. So did state repression there also provoke a politicization of homosexuality? Um, was there anything, I mean, of course there was the Gay Liberation Front UK and I think funded into 1970 or 71, but was there anything analogous to the homophile movement that was responding to the events um, that you sort of outlined in the, in the talk? Um, yeah, uh, well, firstly, yeah, there was, although it has like a very different focus, I think, in the UK. It's um, the, hom uh, the Homosexual Law Reform Society. Um, I'd have to check on the exact dates around that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that all predates um, 60 uh, Stonewall and the rise of the uh, Gay Liberation Front. And there's also an organization a bit later called CHE, uh, Campaign for Homosexual Equality. Um, they, they have maybe a similar class makeup as, as um, the homophile movement, but they, in, in terms of, you know, that they, they have quite respectable people. I think um, uh, Ian Maxwell, who I referred to in the talk, the, the, the MP, who was um, caught with his trousers down in St. James's Park, I think he then goes on to become a, a chair of one of these organisations, for example, you know. So they, they start off from this, this position of, like, uh, law reform uh, and not this position that the Hong Farm movement starts off with, which is about building an identity uh, and building a community around that. Um, I think the other thing to note is that the British experience in the immediate post-war era is quite different, I think, to the American one. Um, in terms of, you have a Labour government elected in 1945 who implements like a, um, a socialist uh, platform of building a welfare state, um, which is both the NHS, but also in terms of like um, a benefit system, a wider benefit system and a form of housing. Uh, um, unlike the US, obviously in the UK, a lot of housing stock was lost in the war due to uh, bombing. And so um, in that process, this, there's this rebuilding of the education system and the housing, uh, the housing system, which means that a lot more working class people can uh, get a, 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 a longer secondary or, or, and a, a free tertiary education. Um, which produces a completely different social movement in the 1960s, I think, um, in terms of working class culture. Uh, and you also have a, a sort of double baby boom in the UK. You have an immediate post-war baby boom from sort of 45 to 50, and then you have another one again in, in the mid-60s um, that's partly based around this uh, ability for working class people to uh, gain, um, you know, things are different if you, I mean, as gays, I think people recognise this, but like, if you can, if you, if you, in the pre-war period, people, uh, people lived with their parents for a long, for a lot longer, probably until they married, whereas in the 1960s, with this growth of uh, council housing, there was a lot more opportunities for people to have their own flats before they got married, um, which I think has a big effect on things. So it's the idea of the bachelor flat emerges at that time, the bachelor pad, which I think is partly one of the things that gives rise to, uh, gay men having more opportunity to socialize with the gay men and um, move away from cruising in that way in the bars and so in the in the parks. Um, and you see that quite a lot in the reform that actually happened. It has a very strong class basis. Um, when we say like 1967 was the decriminalization of homosexuality, it's not strictly true. It was a partial decriminalization of certain acts, but those had a, a strong material class basis by which I mean uh, you were allowed to have um, two, two men over the age of 21 were allowed to have sex, but they had to be in a private residence 
with a locked door that they couldn't share with anybody else. So for example, if you had housemates or you lived you know, in any sort of form of collective living, if you had a fam family, you couldn't have sex. It had to be, you know, so there's a strong class basis there. Um, sorry, where was I going this? Uh, but yes, and then what you're saying about this dialectical relationship between suppression and the growth of the resistance to that. I mean, firstly, there's, there's, most, there's that material basis of changing British society. Secondly, you have this wider liberalized, like current of liberalization against the laws, of, against laws in the 60s anyway, or when the Labour government came in, there was this uh, move towards like liberalization of divorce laws, liberalization of abortion, and then also liberalization of um, uh, stuff like um, the theatres, like censorship in the theatres was withdrawn, which totally changed a lot of British culture and things like this. Um, but yeah, then, but then in the immediate 19, early 1950s, you had this strong repression, partly driven by um, fears of, from the US, from the Lavender Scare, which were imported, uh, and partly driven by this sort of bad luck combination of an extremely right wing Home Secretary of Maxwell Fife, an extremely right wing uh, commissioner of Metropolitan Police, who led to a sort of nationwide uh, crackdown on vice. And then that really uh, politicised a lot of men who I think otherwise would have passed under the radar in terms of um, middle class and upper class men educated who previously would have gotten away with discreet sex within closed circles, suddenly finding themselves victims. And um, Wild Blood, Peter Wild Blood is the, the prime example of this. Somebody who, you know, would, ne would probably never have made himself uh, part of a political movement for gay rights or for homosexual law reform, but who was sort of, whose hand was forced and, and, and after he'd been prosecuted and jailed and his name was splashed all over the papers, um, what does he have to lose? Uh, so that was like a real drive. And that also had this knock-on effect of liberals within British society basically realising that it was kind of unnecessarily cruel. Um, <clears throat> so something, again, that perhaps pre-war somebody was found in public or there was an innocent party or an innocent party, or, you know, some, it was a sexual assault or something, then that would be something that could be understood in the context of crime. But once liberals started to see people who they saw were like them and were being persecuted for a, essentially a victimless crime, then there was like a wider campaign. And in the end, you know, like the, the reform that happened within the House of Parliament was one on a point of moral principle. Mm. Well, I, so sorry for taking us back to the US context. Um, but last question for me is um, that just a decade later, or a bit over a decade later in, in US activism, you'd get people like Betty for Dan referring to lesbians in the women's movement as the lavender menace. Um, and then sort of this idea of the lavender menace gets mobilized to remove lesbians from leadership positions in, in now in the National Organization for Women and then um, sort of spreads. Uh, and I believe the New York based group, feminist group, Radical Lesbians, uh, in fact, first called itself Lavender Menace before changing its name. Um, I was just wondering if you if you think it makes sense to to draw or trace any links from the Lavender Scare of the 50s to then the Lavender Menace within New Left organizing of the of the late 60s. Um, are there do you think so, are there sort of any any connections any connections there? Um, I don't know about organisational connections, but I think there's a connection in terms of um, the fear within other political movements of the left that homosexuality was still some sort of deviation, bourgeois or sexual, uh, that was going to bring down their, you know, plans their, 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 and damage their prestige and planning and organisation within wider society. So. In the same way that left groups in uh, the US and the UK were obviously purging gay people until really quite recently, uh, you know, in Militant, for example, in the 1980s, who were um, the sort of Trotskyist um, so-called so party within a party who were eventually purged from the Labour Party. Um, they, they regarded homosexuality as a bourgeois deviation right until the late 80s. Um, 
and I think that's, that that was the principle within within now, and uh, that caused the um, lavender menace protest at the at the now conference. It was a now conference, I think. Yeah, um, it was based around the same the same idea, which is that they wanted to suppress the idea that there was this perverted um, uh, part of their their struggle which they um, which they didn't want to discredit them with sort of a wider suburban base maybe yeah this all we were talking is really interesting and I think I'm gonna take now the conversation towards another another aspect of your talk that I found really interesting. So basically, I always say that when I moved to the UK, I realized that there's like a very thick presence of class that expands very much, even like economic determinations. Like it's like very much understood as a cultural marker, which you see in the way people still relate nowadays in many things, like even who goes to Greg's and who goes to Pratt is very much determined by the class you belong to or yourself that you like, you, you self consider yourself a belonging to this particular class. And I think that there were many things that you were discussing in your talk that were kind of interesting to look at from, from that perspective. And uh, yeah, I would like to maybe talk a bit more about that and how this relates to, to uh, gain a squareness. So in your talk, um, you're talking about one particular homosexual experience that happens during the interwar period and uh, is strongly determined by this notion of class, by the class, uh, which in the UK at that moment, as you mentioned, is a very important category to organize society. And uh, then you mention that there's the invert, which is usually like a middle class or upper class individuals. And then you have like the pervert, which is this working class subject. Uh, and I find it interesting that while the invert is understood somehow as like a within a particular pathology that must be kind of like PT or cure, but it's like, as I, as I got it, it's like suffered by something outside, someone that is, is suffered by someone is outside his own will. Like the pervert is, is that who's like, it was understood as like morally decadent, right? Like, so mm -hmm. like someone that could choose not to act uh, that way, but nonetheless, like is engaged in homosexual intercourse or, and, uh, I think it's not a coincidence that this is attributed to the working class, to be honest, because it kind of couples with these conservative and liberal fears um, of the, like the fear of the mass or the demophobia that were like very strong in the pre-First World War, but also in the interwar period, where this working class masses were like perceived as uh, dangerous because they couldn't not uphold this kind of moral standards of the civilized middle class or upper class that we're holding society together. So like there is this idea of the morally dangerous individual that comes to determine also the homosexual working class as well. Uh, but like you were also mentioning more things that I found interesting in this pre-interwar period, like how homosexual brotherhood was strictly established uh, across class alliance, so like the class relations were uh, prevalent there. So I would like to hear a bit more about this. Um, yeah, so I was making a note. So I think in the UK, like you have to, like it's worth looking at that in relationship to or to the the fears of the working class that emerged within industrialization very early on in the sort of um, uh, late 18th and early 19th century, which is this breaking of traditional, the breaking of the traditional social structures after um, uh, after the enclosure of common land and um, and and the the enclosures of common land leading to this uh, reserve army of labour pushed from the countryside where they previously lived in as sort of subsistence agricultural workers. Uh, or, or basic artisans into the industrial centres, um, especially in the north, but also in London and Birmingham. Um, and so the traditional social structures of the countryside broke down um, or weren't carried with them perhaps into the, the cities. And so in the cities, you, 
you start to get this fear of the fact that you have a lot of working class people, the newly working class proletarianized laborers um, living in close proximity. And, and so in the early, in a sort of um, Georgian period, in the early Victorian period, you start to get the first of these moral panics around sexual behavior, around vice, around prostitution, things like this. Um, and there's basically a fear that without the sort of um, the, 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 those traditional models and without a strong central church, um, that where do, that there's this sort of double fear, one of which is of, of working class organization, the second is of a collapse in moral behaviors and moral standards, which becomes the major moral preoccupation of the, of the Victorian era, the, this fear of um, the, the generation of the, of the morality of the working class. <clears throat> which, which is on one hand a moral fear, and as a second hand, there's an economic fear. You know, there's this, there's this, this fear, I suppose, that um, that the, that degeneracy will lead to a breakdown of this sort of work time system of the factory, which is which is vital to maintain in order to to, to run a, an economically efficient factory. If if people descend into alcoholism and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and lack those structures that they will therefore, um, yeah, um, the, 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 they'll cease to be effective workers. And um, and so you, you see that emerging in, in both this like moral panic, moral, moral panic, which comes through in these, this, like these societies for the suppression of vice and attempts like fears around child prostitution and, and a lot of reform of sex laws that emerge in the, um, in the Victorian era, um, not least uh, the Labouchere Amendment, the Sexual Offences Act, which is the thing that actually changes the law around sexuality in uh, sort of, well, around gay sex in the UK, so uh, or in England and Wales. So you start, you have this act, the Buggery Act, 1533, goes all the way back to Henry VIII, which which uh, criminalises buggery, but that's that's quite a hard thing to prove. It has to be. Uh, suddenly and it has to be uh, someone has to ejaculate uh, whereas the Labouchere Amendment changes that to gross indecency which is a very very ill-defined form of any basically any form of same-sex contact or the, the attempt to initiate same-sex contact so that criminalizes cruising but it also criminalizes uh, you know gay bars and things like this <clears throat> um, so that's sort of one aspect of it. And then the other aspect of that is that you get the, conversely, an attempt to enforce a bourgeois model of the family upon the working class. And for the same, exactly the same reasons in terms of efficiency and in terms of social order. Um, some of those are much more patrician and paternalistic, stuff like the model towns, um, Quakers who would build, um, uh, model housing for their workers, like an entire town around their factory for their workers, where everyone would have green space and sanitation, et cetera, et cetera. But also um, they, were, they were dry, there was no pubs, which was like also a big fear, and uh, lots of chapels and then sort of enforced religion. Uh, and then the other aspect of that is um, the bourgeois model of the Victorian family, which is super class-based. Um, because it starts with, uh, well, the, 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 the royal family themselves become the model of the bourgeois family, <clears throat> which continues to, till today. Like the, the royal family is obsessed with a certain model of family values um, because that becomes the model in which the whole family, the whole, sorry, the whole country is supposed to operate. And then the whole country becomes, as a framework, the model, the framework is the, is the heterosexual patriarchal family. Um, with the Queen as the uh, and, and Prince Albert as these model parents. Uh, so I feel like I've deviated a bit from what you were saying there. But then that so but that that's part of the thing that builds this incredibly obsessive English attitude towards class and the class is not simply a um, material economic relationship, but is loaded with on this superstructural level absolutely loaded with um signifiers all the time to do with behavior to do with consumption things like that um because society becomes like very very much like a, a self-policing society yeah i think it doesn't deviate it's really 
tackles the point of how this conception of homosexuality wasn't just isolated around one particular understanding of what it means having sex between same-sex individuals, but it, it has to be put in perspective if, within the, the wider context in which like you were mentioning it, like you were you were saying in your talk. And I think like this this also brings us to another aspect that I find um interesting from your talk. Uh so like where we move we move from a moment in the UK where uh there is the experience of being a male queer is not at all like homogeneous as you were saying like there's a moment in which the two are particular and like so like it's not homogeneous in the sense that class determines also the experience you have as gay men and then we move to a moment in which the two are particular social political and economic change homosexuality uh, as a uni unifying category comes to the front in the society and in the state so creating a context in which the experience of being a male homosexual acquires like a higher degree of homogeneity, let's say, like in relation to how it was seen in previous times, right? And that also helps, ironically, as we were saying before, to create this shared identity, uh, like it wasn't maybe as prevalent before. And this is interesting, I think, because we see that rather than thinking about this idea of of being gay as inherently providing us with this particular standpoint to reality that is kind of shared among everyone just because you're gay, independently of the context and completely ahistorical. I think it like this is pushing us like to think about it, about the idea of being gay in a more historical way, definitely. So it is more interesting, I think, uh, and more useful for us politically. To, to see at, at which moments and in which context being gay is something that we can use to mobilize around and like break these class boundaries and maybe in which moments we need to maybe accept that it's not the most useful category or it's not the leading category, category in that sense and, and that stretching it maybe is going to create this idea of like a kind of abstract idea of who's gay, right? So I think that you identify an interesting change that is coupled with a moment in which class in the UK is weakened as in a meaningful category to reproduce particular social orders that in this case, that it's a capitalist social order, for instance. And so how this then gives way to, or kind of facilitates the framing of homosexuality in itself as dangerous, right? Uh, so I don't know if you have like anything to, to say about this. I found it really interesting. Well, I mean, I, yeah, I totally agree that I think like the category of the homosexual is like historically contingent and based around um, based around those factors that that you can, you know, it's not this, it's not an eternal historical tr like truth. It's like yeah, clearly historically contingent. Um, and so, as to say, homosexuality is a, is a social construct. Um, but I'd say that to say something is a social is a social construct is not to simplify it; it's to complicate it massively. You know, if, if it's just if it's in an, in an, an innate aspect, um, not to say that same sex desire or is not is not eternal. That people don't have haven't always engaged in same sex acts, but the the, the category of the homosexual specifically and the idea of being gay. Um, to say again, so to say that's a social construct is opens it up to so much complication in terms of exactly these com these conversations around class um around what it is that constructs it and that it comes out of this sort of colonial uh desire to, to create these taxonomies of human behavior in order to control and monitor and suppress uh to medicalize and to criminalize but once we accept that and then um I think in terms of looking at its relationship towards, towards English cultures, then yeah, like um, I'm not sure what, what I mean. I guess like um, I guess that like the the emerging in within the UK out of these very very 
contradictory, sometimes clashing class positions of, in, in terms of both a material social class, but also in terms of like a, uh, a cultural understanding of class. Really, like, really complicates this English idea or, this, or the model of homosexuality in England. Um, and I think, I think within that, you can look, you can understand like actually a lot of where the homophobia is also built out of like those exact, those same clashing class things. You know that I think within within English society, like like um, there are real complications in terms of what 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 is under what it means to to be a a, a gay man specifically but also lesbians as well and coming from and coming from a working class background and where the space for that is and that the, the because the emergence of like a positive gay identity with which recognizes itself and is attempting to build a political struggle to recognize its own rights comes so much out of a middle and upper class background in the UK um, <clears throat> has has produced like a level of um, class distinction and class oppression that is like really um, could be extremely violent towards working class queers um, uh, which is not unique to the UK um, but but has a, yeah, has a particular inflection within British culture by which I mean like um, both working class voices, cultures, etc., which you know there there is in the, there have always been incredibly strong queer cultures since the Victorian times within the English working class, which are frequently like capitalized upon and exploited by middle class people, whilst those people don't necessarily get a voice within gay culture, but also that um, coming out as a gay man can be seen to be like an act of like class social climbing in a strange way um that's when it gets yeah yeah very messy yeah i think it's not important like there's always this tension right between wanted to like i understand why it's politically useful for us to have some sort of category like gay that kind of claims some sort of unifying field because that will give us a lot of uh, forces to like build alliance across classes but also we have to bear in mind in which point this is this is uh, politically meaningful and in which moments this is not maybe the most articulated um strategy maybe and that's why i was maybe i was not so very clear when i was um saying it before like that i think that you captured this really well in this transformation from pre-second world, world war to post-second world war yeah, we were in this of the historical dialectic relation between class yeah and class. so yeah just to, like give some examples that that i feel like for example like um the, fo the, 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 the the cultural focus upon middle class gay men specifically within the movement that comes that came from their opportunities to build that came from the very early days um, to build a movement still like really inflects the both the representation of like working class gay culture um, and and also the material needs of of working class gay people. Um, which I think can be left out, but as there can also be these strange interclass tensions or inter both interclass and interqueer tensions around um, people's class backgrounds um, and, and what that means. So, um, so for example, yeah, like the idea, like there is like a thing within English culture of the gay man, especially in, from the north or from a working class background. Who comes out, who leaves where he's from, moves to the city, and that becomes his form of social climbing uh, as a working class person. And then, like this strange relationship that people then therefore have their roots, which they feel aren't really recognised. Um, we should see, and I'm trying to think of an example in the film Pride, for example, there's this tension between people going back and from, from what they perceive as homophobic environments and how that's represented, but actually 
there's no reason like that those communities are more homophobic um, <clears throat> than middle class London communities. And then within, for example, um, the within in, within 20th century gay literature, there's this huge trope of the, the middle class gay man who who is like an audience surrogate who then enters the upper class gay circles. Um, and that that um, and that aspect of sort of his exclusion from that based upon class is, as a gay man. Um, the classic example being um, Charles Ryder in Brideshead Revisited, that he becomes this audience surrogate to, to, to talk about class within the upper class by being a gay man, because as a gay man, he can switch between classes based upon his sexuality, based upon those friendships that are made, those, those queer friendships. Um, Maurice by the M. Forster is another example of that. Um, the Line of Beauty by Alan Hollinghurst. All these, all these books like really play upon this trope that as a as a gay man within gay circles, you move between classes, um, and that gives you a chance to observe it, in a way these other these other classes. And, and Hollinghurst, of course, sort of plays with that in, 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 by 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 focusing it specifically upon Thatcherism and the re his rejection in the end by those classes. But yeah, so yeah, I do think that, that, that this is something that is like both material and then within English culture, especially, or Br and British culture, um, incre incredibly culturally encoded, which perhaps isn't quite the same in, in, in American culture and, I don't know, or in Spanish culture. Yeah, this is really interesting because this idea of class dislocation, like it's something I have experienced myself definitely because of like inherited representations of what it means being gay. And like, it's just like, maybe hard and reflect on that in this way. I mean, it's it also like- no, I, felt, I felt that like on a personal level, I really felt that coming out is that when I came out in like a Northern, uh, a very small like Northern community where they there wasn't that representation my like the, the the avenues for gay culture or for like being a gay man that i experienced in like the early 2000s were were within this like very codified class framework yeah yeah definitely i think all leads very very nicely to the like the last question that i wanted to make or like the last thing i wanted to talk about which is like the prevalence of the or the importance of class in the framing of the gay experience in the present. So like, I remember the first time I thought about this potential difference in the way being gay is, is experienced as in relation to the class, the class you belong to when I was reading Proust. And uh, uh, I know it sounds like a bit of snob, but I remember that I was reading the Sodom and Gomorrah and Marcel, which is the narrator spends like a lot of time making obvious something that was kind of implicit in the previous novels that this is the Baron de Charles. I don't know if that's the correct way of pronouncing it. There was like an invert, like the idea of the invert was coming there, obviously. And that I remember that he was mentioning something like, well, everyone knew he was always chasing younger effeminate guys. And that there was this kind of fluidity and femininity that was allowed to be expressed among this French aristocracy and like the bourgeois, um, the would you see among like Bruce was moving and it was a kind of tacitly accepted that he was just an invert and uh, I remember reading it and reflecting upon my own experience and coming from a working class family in a rural Spain in a context where being gay for me was clearly like a perversity in a way and uh, I remember that at that time also in the tv you would have this um like news like this is like very much in my mind was like a very strong thing of like this idea of the middle class gays as like an economic asset uh, and feeling like I was feeling completely detached from the lives of these people that they were living in a gentrified neighborhood in Chueca and Madrid and uh, I was thinking that maybe I wasn't gay because uh, or, I, or I was homophobic and then later when for instance I discovered Jan Genet much later and I was having a completely different experience on what it means for me for him to be gay, or why is the representations he's giving about homosexuality, and uh, I think there is something about these different experiences for the contemporary moment that 
you are also trying to capture in, in your novels. And uh, I remember in particular in Red Story, for instance, where uh, the way each character fact and relate to their sexuality depends on the networks that they have access to. And it is determined both by their class and by their class aspiration. So it's obviously not like a, as rigid as in the 21st, tw as, as early 20th century. Uh, there's a fluidity and there's more fluidity and stuff, but it seems to me that it is an important aspect on the way you build in the characters and they're just subjectivity. So I would love to hear more about that. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I think I've been trying to like think about it in relationship towards the 1980s um, and so the 2010s and their relationship the, like this rise in a nostalgia towards the 1980s um, culturally within sort of gay society. Like when I first moved to London in the 2000s, like I don't remember having any many friends who would describe themselves as gay socialists, for example. Whereas I feel now like I, I'd struggle to name more than 10 gay friends who, who I have who wouldn't describe themselves as gay socialists, you know, like, and, and I think austerity is my God, has been like a huge driver of that. Um, but I, yeah, and I, but, but also I think there's this, this class aspect, which is that throughout um, the, 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 there was like a, maybe in the UK in the 1980s was kind of the first time that like a, the, the, the socialist movement as a whole, like a mainstream really started to adopt um, causes such as um, such as gay rights. Um, not, not totally, obviously, but there, but there was this sort, of, this sort of, in London especially, related towards like the GLC in the 1980s, the Greater London Council, this coming together of uh, the idea that gay rights were an intrinsic part of any sort of socialist movement. And how that then changes in the 1990s as you get new labor and you get the first like representation of gay men within politics, people like Chris Smith, um, Peter Mandelson. And then this then when Labour get into power, they they obviously introduce like a lot of reforms, they equalize the equalization of consent, and they they remove section 28, which was the key homophobic cornerstone of you know, key cornerstone of Thatcher's homophobic sort of crackdown on. Um, homosexuality for moral reasons, like this rebirth of the, what they called in the 90s, back to basics, uh, 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 Victorian family values. But but the, when it happens under Blair and under New Labour, then it's really tied in with the whole Blair movement, which is um, the, the low working, the low middle class and the aspirational working class, uh, and the move away from the, those more traditional socialist forms of organization towards winning those key constituencies that need to be won through this middle class vote um, through aspiration that gay men become like a big part of that. Uh, they are stood down politically perhaps or depoliticized. And the, I think that like, there's, we live in an interesting time in the UK, well, I don't live in the UK anymore, but when I was living in the UK in the, 2000, the 2010s is an interesting time because I was a repoliticization of um, a lot of LGBTQ people who either wouldn't have been politicized before as working class or they're middle class, but they feel, you know, uh, as younger people cut out in some way. So, so yeah, like that, that, uh, that's something that I want to tackle in terms of the politicization of the characters in my novels and to, to specifically in Red Tory to look at that tension within the Labour Party, within gay people within the Labour Party, that you still have this slightly older generation, people my age and older probably, who still ideologically tie themselves to centrism and this Blairite understanding of, of um, the aspirational gay middle-class lifestyle within the city um, <clears throat> and those values. And then contrast that with like this younger generation of more politicized um, left, left wing and socialist um, and anarchist uh, LGBTQ people who are, who are um, and then that tension obviously like manifesting massively in, and almost violently within um, within the Corbyn moment. Um, 
when they sort of managed to rail and recapture the Labour Party as it were for the left. Um, but yeah, does that does that does that answer the question? I don't know. Like, well, I, yeah, yeah, I think it's interesting. I'd like to talk more about it, but I don't really know. Yeah, <laughs> what I want to say in those terms. Yeah, and it also comes up in the like along in the novel. Like I was thinking about it right now, or some like how there is this fear of the moral degeneracy of the clearly anarchist socialist uh, gay that is gonna pervert. What was the name of the main character? I just don't remember now. Tom. Tom. And then how actually Tom is engaged in within these uh, chemsex parties as well, but he, he kind of managed to live in a double world, which is like the, the fear of them. Like, I don't know if it's been like manifested in a way, this kind of fear of the masses that we were talking at the beginning uh, through like the, like the communists or the socialists that are going to come to destroy the status quo and the middle class is always configure itself as against the socialists or the, the workers let's say and then um, how like there's something that happens a lot i think in gay uh culture which is this, this pretension to uh normativity which is never achieved in a way because we are all always anyways outside this normativity and like we have to uphold to some sort of middle class values of not moral decay, but at the same time, no, no, like many, there's very little people in the gay community that would have exactly what is understood in the straight world as a normative life. And I think that, yeah, but that assimilation, that, that normativity, or the assimilation to like a normative position was, um, was not a dream within Blair, I, within Blairism and within early 2000s gays. Like the idea was very much that, um, uh, once the, the rights were equalised and once gay people were starting to be represented, then their identification with other gay people as a class would, would or as a subject, or as a class, a class subject, or whatever, would, would start to wash away and you would be a nice middle-class gay couple with the, the marriage and a dog or whatever, like more literally the marriage uh, was the aim. Um, and... And then, th so throughout the sort of two thousands, like this, th this was the really transformative, like cultural period for for gay people. And it would be really fascinating to look back on in the UK, which is two thousand to two thousand and ten was the the time when really culturally and socially, um, being get, uh, being gay specifically, I think rather than than queer, but definitely being gay was seen as it, in two thousand. It was still it was still unusual, it was still weird. There still wasn't that rep representation. There was a few gay people, on, like openly gay people on TV, maybe entertainers, Graham Norton, and by 2010, it really changed. Like, that was the big cultural shift, I think, in a, in a similar way to the 1960s. Um, and, and I think what's come since then is, yeah, like I said, like this uh, return of like a, of a different model where where people feel that they'll that, that there's something distinct within being gay, which produces a culture. Because I feel I feel like within the, the Blairite movement, the idea was essentially essentially within that that generation that um, that once the the political struggles were won, there was nothing connecting gay people together anymore. Um, that it was just a, a purely political mm. rights based campaign, um, and that gay culture was would um, drift away and. And actually, like my my inspiration for writing my first book, Chubbs, uh, which is based upon uh, Owen Jones's work, he, I don't, I, and in fact, I know that he no longer holds this position. But he, I heard him on radio, um, a radio program back in the early 2010s or something, talking. Uh, and it might have been a passing comment, but his his basic comment was that um, gay culture emerges only from the, that struggle, and when that struggle disappears, then gay culture disappears. Like you. I, I did idea of idea of it just I, I was so uh I found that such an obscene I was furious that that's what instigated me to write a novel in the first place um I, I don't think you'd hold that position now but I, but I also think like more widely like most people wouldn't hold that position now of a younger generation that that they that they, they want and value something within 
a, a distinct uh, queer political identity that isn't assim assimilable, like that's part of you know, what they want. Sorry, I'm going to run the houses on that answer. But... Yeah, this is all yeah, very interesting. All very interesting. Uh, things to talk about. I, I well, mean, the other thing as well, sorry to say about that and, and relation to that book and sex parties is again like a really there's been a real material change with austerity and with gentrification uh, within the metropolitan, which has always been the, the hub of uh, gay life in the UK um, to do with to do with public to do with queer space. Um, that the, the the I I believe. Uh, yeah, I'll say I believe because I um, I don't know enough about the data of it, but the, the rise of sex parties uh, as a as a as a sort of social form, the collapse of the of the gay bar sort of being coterminous that that as uh, public or semi public you know queer spaces like that have been closed, um, private uh, private gay spaces in terms of um, sex parties have, have blossomed. Um, and that comes with its own in the same way that in the 1960s and the Reformation a lot there is based around a class a class bias of who can possess private space. That's exactly the same question now. And it's that, like you'll notice living in Barcelona, you'll notice having lived in Barcelona, so you'll notice living in London, that the, the, the big question in terms that really determines your access to the world's sex rather than wider gay cultural things is who can accommodate. And that that's collapsing, you know, that, and, and so the, the, the cultural power that comes within the gay scene or the sexual power that comes within the gay scene, the social power that comes purely from having a flat where you can accommodate, which wouldn't have been the case, you know, like when I was first in London, if I wanted to go to a gay bar, there was, well, I mean, for the first five years, I probably didn't live more than a kilometre from a gay bar, whereas now, like, in, if you live in East London or West London, there's very, very few. No, they, they were closing on a massive level. So meeting people in that way and um, and, the, and those sort of sexual opportunities have, have sort of died away. And I, I, I think that's also like a, a material aspect that you have to like start discussing when you discuss like housing basically is like, a, it's like a really important material aspect of like determining sexual culture. Definitely, I and mean, it's fascinating all these things also in the way like what I was trying to say at the beginning of the question, like how the sexual experience of people are shaped by the access they have to particular material conditions, like, and then we can come back to the ideas of the pervert as being determined by their material situations, or like the pervert is that who is going to be sold to have sex with people because they need it economically, let's say, and that, like, this is kind of like always present in the ways that, or it's been like present in the way. But like I well, think yeah, housing yeah. is like super important in general and as a political uh, issue and it, it is also very attached to the way we experience our sexualities in this way that you were describing. I think it's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm probably actually replicating exactly or, or parts of me are subconsciously replicating exactly that when I was talking about when I'm talking about um, chemsex party or sex parties and and the the, the power that comes as a middle class person of owning that space, um, there's also there's also tied in with age and stuff like that. But the access to that um, as a single person, uh, you know, like there is the implication when you talk to people when you go to those parties that that, that, that there is something perhaps inverted about the host and who 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 has like this opportunity to 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 corrupt these other people um but it's a very it's a very unique class position i think in the U, in the in london um to be a single gay man in your 30s who can afford uh, their own flat yeah it's almost a myth <laughs> It's not a myth because there's, there's, there, are, there are loads of people who can, or some people who can do it, but those people necessarily have a very unique class position in terms of like material wealth. It's interesting. I was, I was just reading um, two days ago, I was reading Dennis Altman's book, um, Homosexual Oppression or, Oppression or Liberation, or uh, I forgot the title, but it's, it's this book from 1971. 
and he has a whole, and he's this Australian political scientist who spent a while in the States and he has a whole section on gay life in Britain and that it strikes him as much more stratified by class. And that there was even sort of back in the seventies amongst non-British homosexual activists, such an awareness of, of how much more um, sort of gay worlds were, um, were structured and stratified by, um, by class. It sort of really struck me while I was, um, while I was going through that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I say it was a myth because to me it sometimes comes across as a as a surprise when I confront that. Like the other day in Grinder, someone was telling me that he was in a hotel because he was moving to a new house because he sold his old house and bought a new one. And I was like, what the fuck? Right? You could sell a house and buy a new one. And I had to ask what was he working at? But like it doesn't matter. Like for me, it was like I was really convinced that no one is buying houses in London because it's impossible. And then I find someone that is doing that. So it happens, but it's just like outside the people I are at my reach, let's say. I just like feel completely detached from that. But yeah. yeah. Okay, I think maybe we should... Uh, one last, yeah. just one last point. So we didn't touch upon, but I think is also integral, when especially when you're talking about this, um, the period I was talking about in the, in the talk is is the, the influence of um, public schools, meaning in the UK, private schools, um, boarding schools, and the institution of homosexuality within, board, within English boarding schools as a, as a norm, I think also has this huge knock-on effect uh, in terms of like the determination of the relationship between class and homosexuality in the British imagination that 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 um, the is integral and you know it, maybe not now but 10, 15, 20 years ago and before in in discussing public school homosexuality was the the constant subtext um, and that for a lot of people who would take that sort of pipeline from public school to either the army or the civil service or these middle-class professions um, and, and university and parliament, etc. then homosexuality was, was as intrinsic a part of that that continued in the same way as all the other rituals and relations. And so I think it's quite unusual that when you read like middle-class English writers, uh, heterosexual writers, um, you know, people like I don't know, Christopher Hitchens or, or people who've been through that sort, sort of system, they have a very different relationship, I think, with routinely discussing and understanding uh, sexual homosexuality and the, the, their experiences of homosexuality as heterosexual people uh, within the class system that, um, that doesn't necessarily replicate itself in other countries, that, um, that it's almost like a rite of passage and that, that, that goes to shape like wider middle class and working class conceptions of, of homosexuality in the UK, that it's like a thing that the rich do. Yeah, very interesting. So interesting. Yeah. Okay, so shall we uh, finish now? Yeah, well, thanks for having me. It was, um, it was really nice like, to do the research and Put it together in that way and talk no, to thank you, about you so much you it was yeah it was it was just fantastic um yeah. very interesting and very nice to have a space to talk about this definitely yeah <laughs> um best of luck with yeah. the move next week you Thanks. said monday <clears throat> monday and tuesday yeah i was gonna offer to help but i was like no i'm in london <laughs> i have a friend who's moving tonight actually um just down the road for me and he was he's been stressed about it all week it's anyway it's so I, stressful, it's so stressful. have you already yeah. taken your books down your bookshelf is empty yeah the, this entire room was lined with books and oh. that's, that's always the first part is like you i i moved like a couple of months ago and i was like shit i need to get rid of some of these books <laughs> um yeah. Yeah, half my half of the boxes are just books um okay guys but we've taken you so taken up so much of your time cool. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Yeah. Bye. Bye soon. Bye bye. Good Friday night. Nee, die, die, also die, sagen wir mal, diese Grundidee von Kommunismus, ne? Die ist ja voll geil. 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 Die ist ja voll geil.
иногда русские коммунисты выстояли и избегали с трудностью. Так не успели.